呃，各位亲爱的会众，下午这场的 keynote 是由 Will Stevenson 还有 Aaron s e g e l 来共同主讲。那呃，这边简单介绍一下 ，Will Stevenson 他是 Long Term 的 KDE 的 contributor， 然后他呢在 KDE 呃在 s u s e 呢有八年的工作经验，而且他现在是 Open s u s e 的一个 board member， 然后他也是我们 Open s u s e team 的成员，还有。Boost Team 的一个成员这样子，那他呃非常专注于在呃 Open Source 跟 KDE 这方面。然后呃 Aaron Segal 呢，他去年如果你们有也有来参与我们 Cost Cup 的话，他去年呢已经有呃在我们 Cost Cup 有个非常棒的 Talk， 然后也展示了一些呃 KDE 的呃 Tablet， 然后他本身的。经历是他在 k d 大概有近二十年的一个工作经验，然后他现在是 k d 的呃 EV member， 然后本身也在那个 f r e e d o m Software 有八年的一个经验这样子。那我们现在把时间交给他们。Can you hear me? There we go. Awesome. Hello.、Um, thanks for having me. First of all, it's great to be here. I was here at Cost Cup、uh, last year as well,、um, and I came back again this year、uh, because, well, I was invited. But I also wanted to see、um, some of some friends that I'd met last time、um, and see how things have been progressing. So we're doing a series of talks today about.、Uh, Qt and KDE technology,、uh, OpenSUSE,、um, and how this works as a, dis as a distribution. But we thought that for the keynote, we might step back for a moment and look at the bigger picture,、um, and look at how open source communities that are global tend to work together. The reason for doing this or this this topic、um, is because we find that while a lot of free software communities are In theory, global. There are very real divisions around the world. So we find that we have a very strong、uh, South American、um, community, especially in, say, Brazil, where there's lots and lots of free software used. And we have a community that's based or centered around North America and Europe. And then we have、uh, growing communities、uh, that work with free software、um, in the various countries around Asia.、Um, India is very strong. Um, but we're also seeing large amounts of growth in in uh, Taiwan, um, China, Japan, etc. And、uh, they don't always mix and 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 meld、um, as well as perhaps they could. So we thought we might come and、uh, talk about how our free software communities work, and then maybe later in the day we can have、uh, a conversation、um, together about these things. So before I get into it. Um, I have a habit sometimes of speaking very fast. When I get excited and and really get into something, I'll start speaking very quickly. If I do that, someone up here can just throw something at me, or you know, raise your hand and remind me to speak slower. Great.、Um, before I start, I, I have one small question:、uh, How many people here can work on a free software or open source project of some sort? Okay, great. This is really—it's great to see how many people are doing that. It's also great to see that there's a lot of people here who aren't yet、um, involved, and so this may be something new and interesting to you. So when we talk about software, it's all about technology, right? Computers and, and source code, and it's、uh, computer science. So it must be technical. Well, the interesting thing about free software. Is it's actually about people. What makes it work is definitely the technology, all of the bits of hardware and all the software that gets made. But what really makes free software special and work as well as it does is the people. So this is a picture from、uh, one of our events, KDE events,、um, a couple years ago, 
And we, whenever we have an event, we try and bring everyone together and take a group photo. So this was, this is uh, mostly KDE people. There's also uh, people that contribute to or work with other free software projects that came to um, collaborate with us and talk about various topics. But for us, this is central, the people. Who are the people that make up a project or, or work on the project and how we can get them to work successfully together? When KDE first started, um, there was less people involved than in the front row. And 15 years later, we now have conferences with 500 people that come um, every year to work on the next year's uh, vision. So we're going to be talking a lot about people. And there's, uh, when it comes to bringing or keeping these people together, it really is about communication at the heart of it. So here today, we're all at an open source conference, and we're talking and listening uh, to speakers um, about talking about open source and free software. And this is really important for free software communities, these kinds of events. Um, and for the organizers of this event, by the way, a huge thank you from uh, myself, at least personally, for hosting such an event. It's, it's amazing to see and so important to free software. But these kinds of events are not really, you know, the day-to-day the -day of how free software projects go. Um, sometimes people have this idea that they're very ordered and very, you know, organized and everyone's kind of walking in a row together and there's maybe one person in the front leading them and they're all going in the same direction. And that's not usually true. It's usually a bit more like this where it's a cloud of people that are kind of standing around doing their thing. Um, sometimes a little bit like this where you have small groups that are working on small bits of the, of the, uh, of the project. Um, we're speaking with uh, the project lead behind LXDE last night, and he was saying that, you know, this is very much kind of the way that LXDE is is uh, uh, kind of laid out for people. And in KDE, this is also very much how our community is. Um, KDE is actually not just a, one community, it's actually dozens of small communities that work on individual technologies. Um, Nipomuk, for instance, for uh, semantic uh, tagging and, and indexing, um, contact for groupware, uh, the, the desktop workspace, the tablet workspace, etc. And so we have all of these little groups that work together. And the people in these little groups tend to know each other much better than they know people in other little groups. So it's funny, as KDE has grown into a global phenomenon, this global uh, community with you know, a few thousand people that have been involved in the last 15 years, uh, fewer and fewer people know everybody. And you start to know small groups of people. And it's really interesting. It's, uh, how do you hold this together? How do you make it work so that it doesn't become, you know, just a complete chaos? One of the other challenges that we sometimes run into in free software projects is a person will come along and want to get involved want to contribute something, want to work on something. They see a technology and they go, oh, that is really interesting to me, um, either because it's interesting to me personally or that's my field of research or I want to use this in my business. And so they come to the, the project and they feel kind of different from everyone else. It may seem like everyone else knows exactly what's going on and how to do things and they all seem to be completely on the same you know, side and you feel very, as an outsider, and so how do you make that, that bridge? How do you leap from being, you know, from the blue into the, the yellow with everyone else? The good news is this is a matter of, um, this isn't really how it is. It's mostly just how one sees it. You aren't familiar with the structures inside, etc. But it is a big problem that we often see um, and that can prevent people from being involved and therefore prevent these large open source projects from really being as large and as global and inclusive as they could be. So that's just a very, very brief, brief kind of overview of the, you know, kind of the social structure within many open source projects. I, I will be speaking a lot about uh, my experiences in KDE. Um, 
uh, will be talking a lot about OpenSUSE as well, or from his perspective of OpenSUSE, but also some other projects. Um, but a lot of what we're, I actually hope everything that we, we cover here is not specific to uh, KDE or OpenSUSE. It's actually very general to all open source or free software projects. So the way that we hold together hundreds of people working all around the world from different, uh, different companies, different countries, different cultures, the way we hold this together is through tools of communication. And I thought I would, with hopefully not boring you too much, quickly go through a few of them just to give you an idea of what kind of tools we use. So we have tools for internal communication, so communication between people that are participating, and we have tools to communicate with the outside world. And this is very important. Um, within the community, obviously, you have to coordinate. You have to know what each other is doing so that you don't work against each other accidentally, but you work in the same direction. And these tools um, are we, often technical in nature. So we have revision con uh, control, right, Git or SVN, and these are publicly hosted. Everyone can get to them, and the end work ends up in these repositories. But around these repositories, there's often dozens of, of other tools that get used. For instance, bug trackers. And different project you, projects use bug trackers in different ways. Um, some use them to direct all the feature development. So a feature first goes into their bug tracker or issue tracker. And only once it's in there, then it can it be considered for feature inclusion. Other projects use it only for defects. So when a bug comes up, it gets filed, someone event, you know, looks at it, figures out what to do with the bug report, passes it on to a developer, a developer fixes the bug, hopefully, um, and closes it. Some projects have a bug tracker but don't actually use it. And there are, of course, projects that don't have it at all. And that's a really interesting thing that there, in, in this kind of situation, there is no one size fits all. So when someone comes to a, a free software project that they're not familiar with, they have to learn all of these you know, things. Well, how do you use the bug tracker? Um, even though I've been doing it for years myself, whenever I contribute to a new project, I have to learn all of this as well uh, myself. And this is very important because until you understand these things, um, it can be very difficult to get involved and participate. And this is true whether you're an individual or a company. And this is why it is so important for projects, free software communities, to document how they work. Because if it is just something that, oh, I will tell my friend how we work, but we won't actually write it down anywhere, then people can never find, well, it becomes very hard to figure out how a project works. So we find that almost all of the very successful global free software projects have extensive documentation saying, this is how our community works. This is how we use our bug tracker. This is how we use our revision control. Um, KDE, for example, we have a, uh, a guide for commits. How do you do a commit? How do you review commits? Um, how do we deal with bug reports? And this is all documented in our developer wiki. And you'll find that most projects um, have this kind of documentation. And speaking of fixing bugs and getting contributions in, something that's increasingly common is the idea of patch management. So back in the old days, um, it was more common you just attach a patch to an email and send it to somebody and they got it and would look at it and go, yep, and apply it and it was in. Fewer and fewer projects are doing this um, because it's very hard to do QA, quality assurance. It's uh, very hard to grow this, right? Um, the Linux kernel, used to, Linux used to like look at all the patches and I remember when there were articles being written about Linux does not scale and we can't get, we can't move faster because Linux can't go through the patches quickly enough. So many uh, free software communities have adopted patch management tools. Um, if you use Git, um, you're probably familiar with uh, any number of, of uh, the, the Git tools for patch management um, and SVN as well, Review Board being one that we use in KDE. Um, Garrett is another very good one um, used by the likes of Google and Qt um, for their open project. 
And it's interesting to watch the sometimes cultural collisions that happen. So when someone reviews a patch, so for those of you who haven't, haven't gone through this process before, I'll, I'll describe it very quickly. Basically, you make a change to the program, you upload it to a website that the entire point of the website is to track um, these kinds of, of changes, and then other people who know the code really well uh, can comment on it, review it, and go, yeah, that looks good, or this needs to be changed here before we can put it in, uh, and they can track the testing and all of this. In many cultures, um, I actually live in a country where it's like this, um, it is not unusual if you disagree with someone's idea or what they've done, you just tell them, that's wrong. And over the internet, this can sound very harsh sometimes. And it's not meant to be harsh, but it can sound very harsh. And sometimes people, you know, they hear it and they go, oh, wow, they, I, I tried to put in a patch and they told me it was wrong. And that could be embarrassing or you don't know what to do next. Um, and so it can be a little bit difficult. A little bit of personal advice, I guess, is when you get involved with a free software project, expect to have people be maybe a little bit, uh, uh, what may sound rude, even though they're not trying to be rude. Um, and these are the kinds of cultural uh, translations that we deal with in global free software communities. So basically, you just have to kind of ignore it and keep pushing through, and eventually your patch will get um, accepted. And usually once it does, the person who just told you that your first patch was wrong turns around and goes, that's awesome, really well done, thank you so much. Um, but you have to push through that. And sometimes people find it a little bit hard to get to that point. So we talked about uh, tools to talk to each other in the project. But it's equally important to talk to people outside, in the outside world, for a few reasons. Number one, you want more people working on your project. I assume, anyways. Um, you probably want people using what you've done. I mean, you've worked hard on it. You obviously think it's a good idea. It would be nice if other people used it. But people won't use it, and they won't work on it if they don't know about it. They also won't use it or work on it if they don't understand what makes it interesting and special or how to get involved or how it's put together. So external communication is very important as well. And having people that are already in the project talking on a regular basis, um, I often refer to this as continual communication, where we use social media, blogs, or you know, Facebook groups, etc., to talk to people um, about what's going on. I actually find that the OpenSUSE group here I'm on your Facebook group, um, does a really good job of this. I get all kinds of updates um, on Facebook about uh, OpenSUSE from the people here. Um, a lot of it is in Chinese. I don't read it. I don't understand that, so, but I see them go by, <laughs> um, which is great. Um, we uh, do blogging as well. And when I was here last year, we actually set up um, a planet, a blog aggregator. Um, for in uh, the, uh, the Chinese language so that people uh, here could actually blog in, in Chinese. And this is on the main KDE planet as well. So this kind of communication helps other people know what we're doing globally but also locally here and understand, you know, why is KDE interesting and why do I want to use it. We do press releases. We write user documentation. We have wikis full of... Um, information that's interesting to people outside the project. And it's not just people who um, are going to contribute to your project or are going to use your, your software um, or even contribute directly. The free software world is huge and there's many times a project that would be really great if it paired up with your project. And you bring the two technologies together and you make something new that's even better. Um, again, we were talking with the fellow from LXDE the other night, and this is pretty much what LXDE is. It's a fusion of a whole bunch of really great projects. Um, and so, if, but if people working on other free software don't know about what you're doing, how can they get involved? So these tools to communicate inside and outside are critical. And when you first come to a free software project, um, I would suggest or, or recommend that you look for these, these places. Where is it documented? How to get involved? 
Um, where is it documented? Who to contact? What are they talking about? Where's their, their blog so you can get the, the updated news, etc. And if you can't find this, ask, some, ask somebody in the project and let them know. I can't find anything about your project and I wish I could because sometimes people inside the projects aren't aware that uh, this communication isn't happening. Aside from the social structures that hold together the people who contribute and collaborate on the projects, we also have a growing number of formal management systems um, and structures. So in KDE, we have a nonprofit that is uh, registered in Germany. We also have uh, subsidiary nonprofits that are registered in Spain, um, in France. We have a group in India. I don't think they actually have a society ship in India right now. Um, but we have these groups around the world. We have um, a group in South America. Um, the main group for KDE is called KDE EV. EV is a, um, a German acronym. Um, basically, it means a society, a, um, a social group that comes together to work on a specific thing. And these formal groups, these formal structures, can enter into legal agreements. They can own property. So oftentimes, as the project gets bigger, you end up having many servers. Um, you have, uh, well, we, I showed the picture earlier of our annual conference. We have the big one once a year, and then we have about two small ones every month. So this, of course, takes a lot of uh, uh, work, um, funding, organization, et cetera. And all of this is kind of orchestrated and coordinated through this foundation. And the foundation is made up of people who contribute. So it tries to represent who the, the, uh, the community is. And this is increasingly important for large global free software projects. Because as free software becomes more popular and more important, well, it becomes, we, we end up with things such as uh, copyright. How do we deal with copyright properly if someone, you know, goes away or, you know, we had um, a developer uh, or a contributor a couple years ago who actually died, unfortunately. Um, what do we do with their copyrights? How do we manage that? How do we deal with patent problems? I mean, it's technology, software. We all know the problems that are in around patents and software right now. Um, and additionally, yeah, how do we handle the funds? So you'll find that all the large global uh, projects also have formal management structures that help to work on this or on these topics. They also serve a very important function for companies. So if a company wishes to get involved with a free software project, often it's best to start by going to the formal management structure, or, um, such as their foundation, because often they have a business-friendly group who can actually say, oh yes, I represent the, the interests of the project and you can work with them. If you try and work directly with the contributors, um, it can often be harder to figure out how to, to make this cooperation work. So I've talked a lot about kind of the theory of how free software projects that are large and global tend to work, what kind of social attributes they have. But sometimes theory is, is you know, not overly clear. So we thought that we would um, look at a few real world um, use cases, and this is where I hand it over to my good friend here, Will. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I might not be quite as well known as Aaron, so I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Will Stevenson. Um, I'm a KDE contributor. I'm also a member of the OpenSUSE project, um, and I have the fortune at the moment to sit on the OpenSUSE board. And I'm a member of the OpenSUSE team, which promotes OpenSUSE now. So just thank you for OpenSUSE to bringing me to Taiwan for the first time. And my perspective is going to be a little bit different from what Aaron's been talking about. Uh, Aaron's been talking about the structures in existing open source uh, large global communities, but what if you're one guy or one girl on a, and you have a software project, something which you're doing which is new, and you want to make, grow that into a global project? Well, let's have a look at why you might want to do that and how you might go about doing that with the aid of a few little examples. So why might you want to have a, a worldwide community? I mean, you've just written some amazing uh, widget or some app, and it meets your needs. But how do you take it to the next step? I mean, some people in the audience, you probably already know that. I mean, you know that you want global domination. 
you want your widget to be the next big thing, and you want to get it bought out, and you want to sell that, and you're going to make a load of money, and everyone's going to know your name, right? But for the rest of us, maybe it's not so not so obvious and uh, a point. So why might you do it? You might want just to get some recognition from your peers. You might want other people in your class, um, in your university, in Taiwan, in the whole world, to know what you've done that's so cool. Another very big factor is it really improves your job prospects, um, probably more so than if you join an existing um, software project, if you take a small project and turn it into a success. You might just want to make sure your project is going to be a long-term success, because at some point, you're going to graduate, you maybe get a job, you don't have so much time to hack, or you come up with a new, more interesting project, and you want your existing project to have a life and to carry on on its own. So you want more people around it. Also, having a larger, more global project increases the opportunities to fill that project. Things that you cannot imagine will happen just like that by themselves if you have more people with different viewpoints, different uses coming into that project. It's a magical thing, and I encourage everyone, no matter what your degree of skill or your specialization, is just start, some, start a little bit of code Facebook, tweet it, put it out there, and see what happens with it, because magical things will happen. You'll meet interesting people. No. Well, you might meet somebody else. Maybe not me. I'm not that interesting. But your perspectives, your ability to learn, and your ability to program will be shaped and defined. It certainly happened to me um, through getting out of just writing those little programs that help you, or scripting some, some application or some web application that meets your needs in ways that you just can't think about yet. And then for anyone that does have an existing project, I'm sure you all know about the, the, pro, the bugs in your code where it really sucks, but you know how to work around them, you know how to live with them, and you don't notice them anymore. But if you get other people into that project, they're going to find those bugs and think, oh. Why didn't he fix that? Stupid guy. And they'll just fix it for you, and it's done. So some of us would think, well, I don't need those things. My life is fine. And that's great. I'm really happy for you. Some of the rest of us, well, we're working in a coal mine with our heads on fire. We want to get out of there. There's some guys in a coal mine in the 19th century, America. and. The kind of opportunities that I mentioned that come around from having a worldwide community, having your name known, will come to you naturally, and you can get out of that nasty, dark place. So how might you go about making a really good worldwide community? There's a few things that I've put up here in no particular order. Um, we'll start with one, being responsive. If you put your, web, your code up on, say, Google Code, or GitHub, or Gitorious, or SourceForge, or any one of a number of different portals, people are going to come to you. And you might not feel like it, because you might have an exam the next day. You might just be coding on a really good feature. But it really helps to be responsive and to get on in contact with those people as promptly when they contact you, review their code, form a relationship, learn from them, they learn from you, they keep coming back. There's nothing sadder than when you, for some reason, you were busy and you look in your emails and you find a really good patch and you didn't review it for maybe six months or something and then you reply to the guy and he says, ah, oh, I'm not interested anymore. You think, what a shame, what could have happened there? But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. For that to happen in the first place, your project has to be accessible to the, the wider world. And I don't mean accessibility in terms of for people who, who have vision problems or um, other reasons. That's very important as well. But generally, it has to be accessible to everyone. So that means don't just put it on, on SourceForge. Put it, upload it somewhere. Submit it to indexing systems, uh, directories, um, like FreshMeet for one. Um, Get it packaged for distributions. They will talk about it. Put it out on mailing lists. Promote it. Um, submit it to conferences. 
All those things will make sure people know about your thing, and that is 99% of the work. If you can do that, the code doesn't have to be amazing. Don't be too worried about how, how good your code is or whether you're an interesting enough, cool rock star programmer. That doesn't happen. 99% of it is just walking the streets of the internet and putting your code out there where people can see it. But once you've got your code there, you have to make sure you're there for contributions. So don't just have, have tarballs somewhere on a web page that you created. Use a shared, use an internet accessible source code repository, like Gitorious, like GitHub. That means it makes it very easy for people to look at your source code, to find errors, submit patches, and add their own things. And make it, just make it really obvious. Make it say, look, hey, I welcome your contributions. It also helps if, you're, if your project is relevant. I mean, there are some projects that I've worked on, like some script to rename my MP3s when I ripped them from CDs. Nobody's interested in that anymore, because who buys a CD anymore? So those things, maybe you don't want to publish those. But if you're doing anything new nowadays, chances are someone else is going to be interested. Don't, don't dismiss how relevant it's going to be. And then you want to make sure that people actually are able to, tell, to test your code, to play with it. Make sure it's easy to get. Package it. Put it in, in DEBs, put it in RPMs. Um, upload it to app stores if you're doing mobile stuff. Make sure people can get it. And keep that code active. Don't just let it rot. People can smell old code that nobody's touched, and it isn't attractive. It's like, it's like you're dirty washing. So, Keep your commits going. Don't just, don't just forget to um, push your changes up to Gatorius. Keep, keep that uh, steady flow of updates. And that will keep the project um, vital and living like a river with fresh water flowing through it. And lastly, it really helps if you're visible. I'm here to talk about KD and OpenSUSE this weekend as well as this, as well as this keynote. Um, lots of other speakers are here. They're here to make their projects visible. So get yourself out there. Um, you may think that you're the worst speaker. You may think you're a terrible English speaker. Um, I'm certainly a terrible German speaker, and I live in Germany, and I often speak terrible German at conferences, but it goes down fine. And you will be amazed at the uh, scope for travel um, and attending uh, international conferences that exists. Even if you're not some famous guy or girl, just that there is much more sponsorship budgets out there than you could possibly know about. So submit talks. You will get lucky, and you'll get to travel far away and meet really interesting people. And in return, you're going to bring stuff back to your project, and that project's going to grow. So now I'd like to just show you a few little examples of some local projects that I was able to find and give you a, a critique of their um, their success, their chances for success. So we'll start with um, LXD. Um, we had a very interesting conversation with PC Man last night at the uh, speakers banquet, and I think I'd like to hold up LXD as a really good example of a Taiwanese project which has become hugely successful internationally. And this is its homepage. It's LXD.org. Um, you can see at the top, it's accessible by default in English. Fact of life, English is the, uh, the global language of free software. Portuguese, uh, Spanish, and Chinese. You've got some attractive screenshots, explanation of what it is. And the, the second thing on the web page is join in. Join our community and, and, and uh, contribute. So you're open. You've got a link to the blog. You've got a link to a planet with other people, contributors, so you see that people are welcome to join. You've got Twitter. You've got evidence of how relevant it is, because all these distributions are using it. And you've got download links, so people can straight away test it out using a live CD or an image. Here on the right, you've got mailing lists. You've got forums developer's mailing list, translations. This is the hallmarks of successful projects. Um, 
an unsuccessful project is like a steel ball. It's very small, it's very hard, it has a low surface area. A successful project is like a big tree. It has many branches, and on those branches are many places that different people can find a place that they can feel at home in, whether it's translations, whether it's design, whether it's marketing, whether it's coding, whether it's testing, whether it's writing new stuff, whether it's fixing old bugs. These big branching projects or these projects which, instead of being like a small metal ball, if we take the example of two small projects, the unsuccessful project is a smooth, hard metal ball. The, unsuccess the successful project is like a, a walnut with a, a high surface area. So you've got IRC, you've got forums, you've got lots and lots of contact points. Um, then we look at Clonezilla. It's a famous live CD for, uh, and for fixing disk images and cloning disk partitions like uh, Partition Magic on uh, Windows. And again, English homepage. You've got lots of news, access, uh, evidence of activity. Uh, downloads, testimonials showing that it's relevant, forums, mailing lists, FAQs, links for developers, how can I get involved? Lots of credits, so people get, who get involved in your project get recognition. It's all very positive. And I don't know, is anyone from Clonezilla here today? No. Well, they haven't, they obviously, they don't employ a lot of designers, they don't spend a lot of money or effort on this website, but all the information is there, and that's what makes it a big success, and people use it as their standard tool, Linux-based tool for disks. Now, as a, as, and again, um, with the greatest of respect, if anyone from PC Man X is here, um, I think it's a great tool for what it does. This is an example of project which isn't, which hasn't really gone in the right direction. Um, yes, they have, they have a site, um, they say what it is, um, but there's very little information on the home page. I'm going to go to the English version first because I can, I can uh, read English quite well. But again, you, know, you have only have a, a Chinese language screenshot, which maybe isn't very attractive to, uh, to a, someone from outside uh, Taiwan. You do have some screenshots and things, um, but in general you see that the project has, has stopped its, its development. Um, I'm just waiting for the project link to come up. You'll see that the project link is just a link to the basic SourceForge page. There is no inf information on how to contribute. Um, if I look at the documentation, again, this is going to take a little while to come up. The documentation page it only says uh, under construction, and that means no opportunity to get involved. And if I click on the forum, which I'm not going to do because the, uh, int the network here is very slow, the forum software is actually broken and it's giving a database error. Um, so really, at that point, your project is not going to attract any new people. In fact, yes, not available, database error. And uh, no, that's the network. And indeed, if we look at the SourceForge page, you see the last release of the project was in 2005. Um, but I'm told that people are still running bulletin boards, so it's relevant, it could have a chance to live. So, um, with that, I'm going to hand you back over to Aaron. I hope I've given you some, some, some points to think about. Um, and remember that your project, every project can be a big success. You just need to take these steps and put it out there. And that's the end of my section. Well, thank you, Will. It's very interesting to see some of the, uh, the local projects and what they're doing. So what can we do with this? I mean, what, what, why do we sit here or stand here and, and, and talk about this for you know, a good 45 minutes now? 
Now, I'll share with you my motivation. There's so much that happens here. There are so many people working with free software, on free software, whether it's Android or web applications or language design. There's an immense amount of technology being created here. But outside of Taiwan, or if we go to Korea, outside of Korea, if we go to China, mainland China, outside of there, Japan, outside of Japan, it's often not visible. And this is unfortunate, because it means we lose opportunities to really bring all the people around the world who are working on these technologies together, and to build even better technologies together, the opportunities to use what we're making. And it's my quiet hope that by uh, doing things like this, where you know some of us visit great conferences like this one in Taiwan, um, Cost Cup, um, we have people from uh, various uh, countries around Asia that come to uh, our KDE events. Um, I'm sure that uh, OpenSUSE does the same. That by increasing the amount of time we spend communicating, talking, sharing with each other, and hopefully sharing how we can build big, successful, globally visible projects that free software will improve and will find new ways to work together. It's really about finding our common direction, and not only the direction of Taipei, and not only the direction of the city I live in, Zurich, but finding a global direction and bringing together as much of this effort as possible. Um, I can name people you know, who live in the United States or Brazil, I can name one guy in Japan, um, and I don't think I can name all that, well I know now because I've, I've come here and met many people, but I don't know if I could really name a lot of people off the top of my head um, that are you know, doing free software projects, but obviously it's happening. And they're great free software projects. So if we can somehow bring this entire, this, you know, the global community a little bit closer together, I think that great things would happen and that together we could forge new directions and get wherever it is we're trying to go a lot faster and a lot better. So that's, that's my hope anyways, and I hope that maybe today was one small step um, in that direction. So thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I know it's right after lunch and that's the sleepy time, at least it is for me. Um, so thank you very much for, for your attention. I thought that maybe we'd save some time at the end and if anybody has any questions or comments um, for either myself or Will, um, we could take some, some questions or comments. And I promise we don't bite. We're very friendly. Oh, right there. Yes. Uh, uh, excuse me. I want to ask uh, uh, you uh, what uh, the community you said is uh, are all big and uh, global project. But sometimes uh, our uh, our interesting project is small and maybe cannot go so large. Uh, so do uh, sorry. <laughs> do you do you mean that small project uh, must go to so large then their value can? Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm too nervous. <laughs> so. I, I I want to ask uh, if uh, uh, Global is the only uh, value uh, our project want to uh, improve. Yeah. Sure. So um, absolutely, Global is not the only way to go. Um, first, I would say that the internet is amazing because for this one reason that you don't need a lot of money to be able to have a global reach. And many projects that are very successful and are, have a, a global community of people that use it and work with it 
have very little um, to almost no uh, budget for money. Um, it's interesting when we gave when we were talking, um, both Will and myself, we really talked about communication, and we talked about uh, how do you get people to work together, how do you document things. We never talked about money. And the reason for that is because these things that actually may allow a project to be global don't actually take much money. You can definitely find large projects that do have large budgets and they host you know, large annual conferences and this is going to be very few projects that can do this because it does take money. But there are thousands of really great projects that are global, um, do everything over the internet, but they follow these, these methods. Okay, so that said, um, staying local is definitely a, an, an option. Um, what we found, just to talk about another country that we've been working with for a number of years, um, India, uh, when we first started going to conferences there as you know, KDE, we started sending people there and you know, finding who was working on free software there and how could we help you know, expand free software with people in India. Um, it was interesting because many of the people in India did not know who else in India was working on free software. So these same things that can help a project be global are also important if you want to be successful locally. And so over the last you know, four years or so in India, um, or five years I guess now, uh, it's become, we've, we now have a, a much bigger and thriving community of people that contribute to KDE from India and it's almost exclusively and only because people in India started to notice each other and started to talk to each other and started to meet up once in a while when they could. So even if you're going to stay um, local, and there could be many reasons for this, maybe it's a, pro a program that only makes sense locally. Um, there's a, an instant messaging network that's pretty much only used in Poland, for instance. So I mean, that's going to be a project that probably stays in Poland and, and with people who are from Poland. Um, but even these projects need this communication and whatnot to be successful. And uh, if I can also add an, another answer to your question, um, you asked about growth and whether that was also whether it was only important to have a large project. Is that correct? Yes. So, um, as an anecdote from my experience, as a project can be global without having to be large. Maybe maybe you don't like being in a crowd. Um, so about ten years ago, um, I started contributing to an instant messaging project. Um, for KDE called Carpeter, and that was started by a guy in Chile, and I was living in England at the time, and that project never became very big. It's kind of, it's nearly dead now, it's been replaced, but there were only ever about maybe 10 or 15 people involved, but they were from all over the world. Um, there was a guy from China, a guy from Poland, a guy from Chile, two guys from Canada, a guy from America, a couple of guys from Germany, a guy from France. Um, and no, even though we were only ever a small project, it was highly in, uh, influential for a lot of people. A lot of people enjoyed using it, and it was very influential for all of us in the team. Um, what happened was the guy from uh, my work got me my job at SUSE, where I've been working for the past eight years. That changed my life in a significant way uh, in working on instant messaging. And then, as soon as it was possible, I, uh, I got the guy from Chile who started the project hired. He moved to Germany, changed his life completely. He married there, settled down, had children. And doesn't, maybe, that, maybe that's not what you're looking for, but uh, these are the kind of the surprising opportunities. Another guy, he went to work for Trialtech, now he, he worked for Nokia, now he has a startup in Berlin, cool city. These are the opportunities you can't predict. So you don't have to go big but just go wide. Thank you. And, and thanks for the question. It was very good. Yes. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a question. Uh, because, uh, uh, as a large, large community and a large project like KDE, uh, there are many people in the project, but when there are many people, you, you cannot please all the people all the time. So there are sometimes uh, people in the project have different idea about the design, uh, even the API design or UI design or anything. Um, so how you resolve this kind of com complex, uh, creating forks or creating competing 
computing implementations and choose, choose the, the best one or voting or any, anyway, how, how you resolve this? Thank you. So there is no one answer to that. Different projects do it differently. Um, some projects have one person who just, if you can't decide, they decide. <laughs> they just say, we're doing it this way. Um, some people like that kind of, of decision making. Um, personally, I'm, I don't, but that's how I am. Um, other projects try to avoid the topic, and whenever it becomes a disagreement, everyone just walks away, and no one talks, and they go back to writing code, and it's like, ooh, it didn't happen. Um, this is not very useful, <laughs> but it's how some projects deal with it. Um, in KDE, what we try to do, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, um, is we try to come to a consensus and we talk about it and we go, well, uh, what could work? And then once we kind of have an idea, then we, we have this, the person who does the work decides. And so once we've kind of discussed it and, got, and gone as far as we can, then we actually try stuff. And at that point, it becomes very obvious, right? Um, does it work? Yes? No? Does it work well enough? Sometimes you, you go, ah, I don't know if it's going to work, but then it does. And then, well, there you go. Now you have code that works, right? Um, and we have done in the past. So K3B, the CD DVD burner, um, when that came out, I don't no idea why, but that year there were no less than I think six different, only the KDE ones, um, CD DVD burners, and like four of the projects came to us and said we want to be the KDE burner project, and we looked at them and went, well, we don't know which one of these projects will be maintained in three years. We don't know which one will work. They're all very young and new, and none of them worked 100% yet. So we just said, look, we'll host all of the projects. We won't call any one of you the KDE pro uh, uh, burner, but let's just see how it goes. And what happened was K3B, which at the beginning was not the one that I thought was actually going to be successful, the most successful. Uh, they're all going to be OK. Um, but that one just became amazing. And so it was just through experimentation. Um, if there's anything I can suggest to other software projects or other people, it's one, talk to each other and, and, and do it openly. Don't yell at each other. Talk to each other. And then don't be afraid to try something, even if it might not work. And don't stop other people. Sometimes we watch people stop other people from trying something. It's okay to fail, right? Because failure is how it's, it's on the path to success. <laughs> um, and so that's typically how we, we tend to deal with it. Um, just as another example, the CD, was a, CD burner was an easy example to solve because the, prog the, uh, pr the different comp competitors were not mutually exclusive. You could have multiple ones. But say someone suggests two different ways of solving a problem and there can be only one. Um, for example, some st your storage library or something that all the programs should share. That's a much harder one to, share, to, to solve. But we do solve that in KD and in OpenSUSE. And the best way to do that is literally to have people do the work and then have a mature and civilized review of those, um, those approaches, like peer review of a scientific theory. Um, if you do that, then immediately you cut out all the people who don't want to do the work, but they just want to talk and they just want to shout a lot. Because those guys, they're, they're a problem for your project. If they're not doing something useful, if they're only just having an opinion and they're not doing the work, you need, to, you need to turn down their volume, okay? <laughs> and then you can, you can look at the, the existing work, the people who are really willing to do things, and you will, everyone will learn so much from their comparing those different approaches, and you will end up with the best solution for your project. If you end up with someone who writes the code and won't back down, again, it's hard, but you have to give them a bit of a push and say, look, we cannot agree here, Maybe you fork the project, maybe you take this code, maybe it doesn't go anywhere, I'm sorry. But nothing will kill a project faster than having a war inside the project all the time. So as a responsible project leader, or core of the project, you have to try and stop that battle. Okay, thanks for your question, good question. Finished?
。谢谢那个 Will 还有 Aaron 的演讲，那请大家再给一个热烈的掌声，谢谢他们。